This video will focus on the historical aspects of the generals and officials from the Three Kingdoms period of China, but will also include information from the romanticised version of events at times. Xiang Wei The Prodigy of Tian Shui He was a military general who started off his career serving the Kingdom of Wei, until he was suspected of being a traitor and forced to defect the Shu Kingdom. He went on to earn the admiration of Shu's Prime Minister, Xu Ge Liang, partly due to Xi Yang Wei's everlasting loyalty to the Han Dynasty. As the years went on, his dutiful attitude eventually earned him the highest military rank of General-in-Chief. Xi Yang Wei loyally served the Shu Kingdom until its demise in the year 263, but continued to fight for its founder's ideals to restore the Han Dynasty up until his death. Xi Yang Wei has been praised and slandered many times by historians, making him a somewhat controversial figure. An ex-Shu scholar who went on to serve the Jin Dynasty, Xi Zheng, states that many look to Jiang Wei as a role model, and it is noted how throughout his entire career he was neither extravagant nor shabby. He kept his spending within budget and remained incorruptible. He chose to live in a simple way, like how his house and means of travel only needed to meet his basic needs, nothing more. He refused concubines and stayed with his only wife up until their death. Jiang Wei's honourable life is regarded so highly as he acted not to prove himself to others, but because he truly relished what he already had. He managed to balance his ambition without it turning into greed, which was a rare disposition to have in such trying times. Sun Sheng, a Jin historian, disagrees with this assessment of Jiang Wei. He states how Jiang Wei did not live by the four fundamentals of a scholar official. Loyalty, filial piety, righteousness and integrity. By betraying Wei to join Xu, he proved his disloyalty. His tragic death and abandonment of his family shows he was unfilial. In his final hours, he ordered officers of his native state to be killed, therefore he was unrighteous. And finally, because he lost battles but chose to live on, it shows he had no integrity. Sun Sheng also states that Jiang Wei should not be considered a role model, as he forced his people into a prolonged war for his own personal glory, which he ultimately lost, showing his lack of wisdom and courage. It is noted that historians of the Jin Dynasty would have had to take caution when writing about famous generals such as Jiang Wei, and would have most likely left out praiseworthy notes to not raise suspicions of misplaced loyalty. The Liu Song Dynasty historian, Pei Zhongji, is generally favourable and sympathetic towards Jiang Wei, whilst also rebutting Sun Sheng's comments about him. Let us be the judge of who Jiang Wei was, as we take a look at the achievements and failures of his life. Born in Tianshui Commandery in March of the year 202, Jiang Wei's father died suppressing non-Han Chinese and Xiang tribes, so he was raised alone by his mother. In his youth, his eager desire to become famous one day drove him to raise a small private militia force. He had a firm interest in the late Han politician and philosopher Sheng Shuan, who went on to serve Yuan Shao after the Han Dynasty collapsed. Sheng Shuan was credited for studying the Confucius Old Text School that challenged the Orthodox New Text School. He attempted to end the rivalry of the two schools by picking what he thought were the best teachings of each, then compiling them into one. Perhaps Sheng Shuan's new teachings influenced Jiang Wei's character somewhat, which could explain why his actions are looked down upon by some, whilst at the same time being praised by others. When he came of age and joined the state of Wei, he started off as a clerk, but worked his way up to be an assistant officer. By the year 228, he was recognised as his father's son and given the authority to participate in military affairs within the commandery. This led to his involvement in the Tian Shui revolts. When Zhu Ge Liang launched his first northern campaign against Wei, he sent Zhao Yun and Deng Zhi to threaten the nearby counties. The commanderies of Nanan, Tian Shui and An Ding all revolted against Wei and surrendered to Zhu Ge Liang. This caused much chaos throughout Liang province. Xiang Wei is currently involved in patrolling and inspecting the region, alongside his administrator Ma Zun, who soon became suspicious of Xiang Wei and abandoned him one night to flee to Shangui County. Xiang Wei was denied entry to the city when he eventually caught up to Ma Zun, so he headed back to his home at Ji County, but he was also denied entry to this city as well. Left with no other choice, he bolstered his unit of rebels and then surrendered to Zhu Ge Liang. After Zhang He defeated Ma Su at Xie Ting, Xu forces called a full retreat, and so Jiang Wei made his way south to his new home. In his biography, it is noted that Jiang Wei received a letter from his mother 
asking him to return to her, which he replied, when one's ambition lies far away, he will not return home. There is an alternate account of how Jiang Wei defected. It states how Guo Huai was alongside Jiang Wei and Ma Jun as they inspected the area. Guo Huai caught on to Zhu Geliong's schemes and so left for Shangui County, which caused Ma Jun to follow out of fear of the rebels. Ma Jun got into a dispute with Jiang Wei about going back to Ji County, as the latter was worried about his wife and son, which it is claimed he already had in this version of events. Ma Zun warned Jiang Wei about going to Ji by stating if you go back, then you will become my enemy. Jiang Wei went anyway, where the common people there insisted that he meets with Zhu Geliang right away. They had a pleasant discussion, which unfortunately meant that he didn't have enough time to fetch his family, due to Ma Su's defeat at Xie Ting, which then forced the Xu forces into a retreat. In this version of events, Xiang Wei's family members' lives were spared, but they spent the rest of their days in prison. It was around this time that Zhu Giliong saw great promise in Xiang Wei by stating, Xiang Wei is loyal and diligent in performing his duties. He is very thorough and detailed in his thinking. After assessing his strengths and character, I think Yon Nan, Ji Chang and the others are not as good as him. He is truly a great talent from Liang province. After this, Zhu Giliong appointed him as the assistant official in charge of food. I presume Jiang Wei performed his civic duties well throughout the years involving Zhu Giliong's five northern campaigns, as in this time he received multiple promotions, plus was enfiefed as the Marquis of Dan Yang village. Zhu Giliong passed away in the year 234 at the Battle of Wu Zhang Plains, with his regency being passed on to Jiang Wan, who had previously provided logistical support for Zhu Giliong whilst dealing with internal affairs. Jiang Wei made his way to Chengdu for reassignment, Whilst he was promoted from a village Marquis up to a county Marquis, he was also put in command of Chengdu's military forces. Four years passed until Jiang Wei and Jiang Wan went to Hanzhong Commandery. Here, Jiang Wan was promoted to the Grand Marshal, whereafter he assigned Jiang Wei as a major under him, giving him command of a separate army to launch attacks into Wei territory. Due to Jiang Wei being a defector from Wei, he knew that he had to prove his loyalty to Xu and so begins the first of 11 northern expeditions that would be attempted by him. In the year 240, Jiang Wei's army marched for Longxi Commandery, but met resistance by Gua Huai's army, who drove Jiang Wei too close to the Xiang tribe's territory, which then forced him to retreat. Gua Huai went on to defeat the Xiang tribes anyway, whilst also recruiting around 3,000 members of the Di tribesmen as well. Seven years later, the Xiang tribes under the leadership of Ehei, revolted against Wei, and called upon Xu for assistance. As Jiang Wei led his armies north to answer this call, he received the support of two influential kings from Liang province, bolstering his forces greatly. Zia Hao Yuan's son, Zia Hao Ba, was sent to deal with Jiang Wei, but Guo Huai also arrived to provide assistance for the Wei forces. Guo Huai's advisors recommended that they quell the Xiang rebels before engaging Xu's main force. But he disagreed with this and successfully predicted Jiang Wei's movements, so instead he led his army to support Xie Hao Ba before Jiang Wei could engage him. Jiang Wei was forced to retreat after this, whereafter the Wei armies easily put down the Xiang tribes, forcing thousands to yet again surrender to Wei. A year later, Guo Huai marched for Xi Hai Commandery because the family of another Xiang rebel leader named Xi Wu Dai was located there. Xi Wu Dai had just failed to capture Wu Wei Commandery and so led his tribesmen home, where he engaged Guo Huai's army and was forced to retreat. Jiang Wei left Liye Hua at Chengzhong Mountain to build a fortress to shelter and recruit Xiang tribesmen, whilst he himself continued on to relieve Xi Wu Dai. Guo Huai wanted to split his army into two, with the one assaulting Liye Hua's fortress and the other to slow Jiang Wei's advance. The other Wei officers disagreed with this, as they felt their divided army would be too weak to accomplish both objectives, so they urged him to fully focus on Jiang Wei's unit. Yet again, Guo Huai went against the advice of his officers. He successfully caught Liye Hua off guard whilst he sent Jia Hao Ba to harass Jiang Wei, forcing him to turn around. This in turn led to Ji Wu Dai and his tribesmen disbanding by themselves when no help arrived. This also marked the end of Jiang Wei's third northern expedition. In spring of the same year, 249, the Wei regent Tao Shuang was disposed of by his colleague Sima Yi, who then seized control over Wei's government. This led to Jia Hao Ba defecting to Shu as the Tao and Jia Hao clans were close, and he no longer felt safe under Sima Yi's authority. Xiang Wei launched his fourth northern attack a month later, 
where he built a fortress in Yong province and awaited on reinforcements from the Xiang tribes. Guo Huai sent Chen Tai, Zhu Zhi and Deng Ei to block off the awkward roads that led up to the fortress, as he knew how difficult of an area it would be to keep supplied. A few Shu officers within the fort tried to taunt Deng Ei into action, but he just ignored them. As time passed, the food and water ran short. Chiang Wei was forced to try to relieve them, but was blocked by Chen Tai, who had built forts of his own to guard the roads. Meanwhile, Guo Huai led his troops across the Tao River to capture a nearby mountain in an attempt to isolate Chiang Wei. This forced him to retreat along an alternate route, resulting in him abandoning his officers in the fortress. Chiang Wei pulled back, but did not call for a complete withdrawal from the area. As Guo Huai moved on to suppress the restless Xiang tribes, Deng Ei remained vigilant to Jiang Wei's movements, as he and his few men were in a vulnerable position. Reports arrived that Liao Hua's unit was en route to engage Deng Ei, which he immediately deduced as a distraction ploy, so sent what few men he could to reinforce Tao Sheng. Deng Ei's correct prediction of Xu's assault on Tao Sheng left Jiang Wei with no viable option other than to retreat back to Xu. Jiang Wei led a very short-lived assault into Xi Ping Commandery in the year 250, but as he failed to make any progress, he cut his losses and headed home. Despite his failed expeditions up until now, Jiang Wei remained confident in his military capabilities. He would often boast how easily he could take control of the Wei lands in Liang province, so long as he had the support of the Xiang people. Fei Yi grew to disapprove of Jiang Wei's aggressive attitude towards Wei, and so put a limit of 10,000 on how many soldiers he was allowed to take into battle. Fei Yi spoke to Jiang Wei, and explained that, We aren't as brilliant as the Imperial Chancellor. If even he can't stabilise the Empire, what makes you think we can do it? Wouldn't it be better to defend our state, govern our people well, respect and safeguard his legacy, and then pass it on to future generations? Stop your wishful thinking that you can achieve victory in one fell swoop. If you fail, it will be too late for regrets. Fei Yi's untimely death three years later makes one suspicious of Jiang Wei. For once he was gone, Jiang Wei was allowed more power within Xu's military, which allowed him to launch further expeditions into Wei. A Wei civilian named Guo Ziyu attempted to assassinate Liu Shan, but could not find an opportunity and instead settled with Fei Yi and killed him at a party. It just so happens Jiang Wei had captured Gan Ziyu in a previous attack against Wei, which connects him to the crime as well as him having motive. If Jiang Wei was the culprit, I'd imagine he wouldn't want it to look obvious that Fei Yi was the target, so perhaps ordered Gan Ziyu to shoddily make an attempt on Liu Shan's life beforehand. Summer came a few months later, so Jiang Wei launched a sixth expedition into Liang after he heard that the Wu forces were marching on Hei Fei. He sought to catch Wei off guard and so led his men to siege Dideo, Sima Shi, who was the Wei regent at the time, decided to focus on Shu more than Wu, and ordered Guo Huai and Chen Tai to march from Guangzhou region and relieve the city. Chen Tai launched a swift counterattack against Jiang Wei, who struggled to deal with the extra reinforcements. Jiang Wei stayed as long as he could, looking for an opportunity to strike, but had to retreat in the end once his army ran out of food. The next year, Jiang Wei was granted authority over internal and external affairs, he decided to launch another attack to capture Dideo, which resulted in victory after the Wei official posted there surrendered. The Shu forces continued on and captured more counties after a successful battle against Wei forces. The Wei general Zhu Zhi was killed in this fight, but so was the Shu general Zhang Ni. Jiang Wei then relocated the people from these three counties and took them back to Shu with him. A year later, in 255, Sima Shi passed away. Jiang Wei announced to the Shu court that he would take advantage of this by leading the largest army yet in his next northern expedition. This time, Zhang Yi spoke out against them, stating how the people are tired of war and the state's resources won't maintain the army that's needed to secure victory. Jiang Wei ordered Zhang Yi and Zia Hao Ba to be his deputies and drafted 30,000 Shu soldiers for his next attack and then led them to Dideo once more. Wang Jing was an inexperienced administrator who oversaw Liang province. He reported to Chen Tai that Jiang Wei planned to attack on three fronts and wanted to engage the Shu army on all three, but Chen Tai was in disbelief that the Shu army could muster an army that large so soon, but nonetheless he didn't take any chances. He ordered Wang Jing to defend Dideo, sent a letter to the capital to request reinforcements, and led a relief army towards the strategic location of Chen Kang. Wang Jing incorrectly thought he had the advantage over Jiang Wei's army, 
he chose to leave the walled city and launch a preemptive strike against Xu before they had time to recover from their long march. Xi Yangwei engaged Wang Jing's army at Gu Pass. Taking advantage of the terrain, he scored a massive victory, where over 10,000 Wei soldiers drowned as they fled through the Tao River. It should be noted, this army was made up of the best soldiers from the region, so the loss was that much more devastating for Wei. This battle was Xiang Wei's greatest accomplishment from all of his northern expeditions, so he looked to ride the momentum onto the Deo, despite Zhang Yi correctly pointing out that the Shu army faced logistical problems if they did. Chen Tai learned of their defeat, so sent a second messenger urging the capital for reinforcements, whilst leading his men to assist Wang Jing. At the Wei capital, some feared it was too late and wanted to give up on relieving the region, but Sima Zhao insisted that Shu forces would soon run out of supplies. He went on to state, if Zhu Geliong could not capture the four commanderies in West Liang, then Jiang Wei would certainly not be able to. Deng Ai's forces were sent by Sima Zhao to Tian Shui to hold a war council and assess the situation of Chen Tai. Deng Ai woefully stated it might be better to cut their losses and leave Wang Jing to fend for himself, to wait until Shu forces are tired before attempting to relieve the city. Everyone was in agreement except for Chen Tai, who gave his detailed opinion on the situation. He pointed out how Wang Jing played into Jiang Wei's hands by instigating a battle, as Jiang Wei was in a race against time due to his supplies being limited. If Wang Jing waited like he was supposed to, then the Wei forces could all attack Jiang Wei together and secure victory. Chen Tai also highlighted Jiang Wei's failure by laying siege to Dedeo instead of riding his momentum eastward to capture the Wei grain production areas. From there, he would have posed a real threat and potentially taken control of both Liang and Yong provinces. Chen Tai's compelling summary convinced Deng Ai and the others to follow his plan, to split into three, then head westward, completely bypassing Jiang Wei and regrouping in the mountains southeast of Dedeo. Jiang Wei's supplies problem became severe with the arrival of the Wei reinforcements in the mountains. They made their presence known to the army inside the castle by wafting smoke from the high positions and beating their drums loudly from the valleys. This massively boosted Wang Jing's morale, knowing that help had finally arrived. Jiang Wei ordered attacks onto their formation within the mountains, but the tired Shu soldiers could not break through, and it became clear that the Shu forces needed to retreat. It's noted that the army within Dideo only had 10 days worth of supplies left when Jiang Wei gave up on his siege. Although Jiang Wei was repelled once again, he dealt a massive blow to the Wei Empire. The Wei Emperor Tao Mao issued three decrees which ordered relief for the war-torn areas. Military drafting and household taxes were not required for a year. Amnesty was granted to defectors and their families, plus Deng Ai and Chen Tai were tasked with recovering the deceased bodies from the Tao River. After a hundred days, they still hadn't buried all of the fallen. Jiang Wei feigned his retreat and came back months later in the year 256 as the wheat harvest would be due beyond Mount Chi, which would allow them to continue their attack. The damage he had done to their infrastructure was immense, and so Jiang Wei didn't want to miss this opportunity. Unfortunately for him, Deng Ai had prepared defences at Mount Chi, which prevented him from passing. Jiang Wei took shelter in a nearby village, and launched attacks into Mount Wu Cheng, which is where Deng Ai was positioned. The attacks were ineffective, so Jiang Wei waited until night time to try and cross the river, but Deng Ai foresaw this manoeuvre as well, intercepted Jiang Wei and defeated him. If the Shu general Hu Ji had arrived with reinforcements on time, then Jiang Wei could have secured a victory here, but instead they suffered heavy losses, where many battle-hardened Shu soldiers and equipment were lost. The fallout of this loss tarnished Jiang Wei's reputation among the people of Shu. He suggested that he gets demoted, which the Shu Imperial Court agreed to. The demotion had no effect on how Jiang Wei acted, however, or how much power he held within the military. The 10th expedition was launched in the year 257, when Zhu Geidan rebelled in Shu Chun. Jiang Wei took advantage of this faraway distraction, as Wei mobilised troops from the area around Chang'an. He led his troops to assault Wei positions at the Great Wall, where he replenished many weapons and supplies from the lightly defended garrisons. It wasn't long before Sima Wang and Deng Ai were sent to deal with him, Xi Yangwei set up his camp with his men with their backs against the mountain, knowing his army would fight harder if there was no way to retreat. Deng Ai and Sima Wang surrounded Xi Yangwei, but gave strict orders not to engage him. Xi Yangwei threw a few insults and taunts their way, but they were non-responsive. Once news of Zhu Geidan's defeat reached Xi Yangwei, he ordered his men to fall back. 
After this loss, Liu Shan restored Jiang Wei's previous title of General-in-Chief. I presumed to reward him for all the supplies that he had gained from the Great Wall. It was around this time that a Shu official named Xiao Zhu wrote a satirical piece about Jiang Wei and his non-stop expeditions into Wei. It was four years before Jiang Wei launched his final northern campaign in the year 262. Liao Hua remarked how Jiang Wei is inferior to the enemy in terms of intelligence and military power and questioned why he keeps attacking them. Jiang Wei occupied Taoyang County this time and poised his army to face off against Deng Ai. Meanwhile at Chengdu, the Shu eunuch Wang Hao, who replaced Dong Yun almost 20 years ago, had gained enough influence to indirectly control the Shu government. Huang Hao sought to replace Jiang Wei with a more favourable officer, which caused Jiang Wei to write a letter to Liu Shan. In the letter, he denounced Wang Huo as a traitor, and urged Liu Shan to execute him. But the Shu Emperor's dislike of conflict meant nothing came from it, except Jiang Wei's own reputation diminishing even further among the court officials, as they all favoured Wang Hao over him. Jiang Wei lost his battle with Deng Ai in Taoyong County, then retreated to Taizhong instead of Chengdu, as he knew that he had been in trouble at the capital. Xiang Wei did manage to convince Wang Hao in allowing him to remain at Tazheng to oversee agricultural production, although really he wanted to avoid getting caught up in a power struggle at the imperial court. Xiang Wei tried to warn Liu Shan that Zhang Hui was amassing troops to invade. He suggested to send Zhang Yi and Liao Hua to guard choke points into Shu. Liu Shan was convinced to ignore this advice by Wang Hao, who had been to visit a fortune teller who guaranteed Wei would not invade Shu. The next year, three separate Wei armies invaded the lands of Shu, Zhang Hui, Zhu Ge Shu, and Deng Ai. Zhang Hui marched for Luo Valley, whilst Deng Ai attacked Jiang Wei at Taizhong. Liu Shan ordered Liao Hua to reinforce Jiang Wei, whilst Zhang Yi, Dong Zhui, and others were sent to Yongan Pass and to assist on the border. They learned of Zhu Ge Shu's location and so halted at Yingping. A month of fighting passed until Jiang Wei suffered a defeat, forcing him to retreat to Yinping as well. Whilst all this was going on, Zhang Hui simultaneously besieged Han Cheng and Li Cheng, whilst also sending his subordinates to capture Yang An Pass. Fu Xian died guarding the pass, only for another Shu officer named Jiang Shu to surrender and open the gates to the Wei army. Zhang Hui, having failed to capture Li Cheng, regrouped his army at Yang An Pass. The four Shu officers regrouped at a mountain pass in Jiangi, where they defended against attacks from Zhang Hui. Zhang Hui's army was running out of supplies by this point, so he wrote to Jiang Wei, where he announced his admiration for him and desire to serve the same dynasty. Jiang Wei responded by tightening his defences and ignoring the letter. Deng Ai opted for a less predictable route, albeit more dangerous. He bypassed the Shu armies via mountainous terrain and showed up at Mianzhu, then defeated Zhu Gejian, who was stationed there. Deng Ai marched on to Chengdu, where he voluntarily received the shocked and surprised Liu Shan's surrender. This brought an end to the Shu Empire. Jiang Wei was confused when he heard conflicting stories about the situation at the capital. Some claimed Liu Shan was fleeing, whilst others reported he had surrendered. Just as Jiang Wei was about to leave to find out the truth, another messenger arrived, ordering the Shu forces to lay down their arms. Zhang Hui was welcomed into the camp and greeted Jiang Wei with tears running down his face and asked, Why are you late? Jiang Wei's response impressed Zhang Hui when he stated, Our meeting today came too early. Jiang Wei did not relent in his ambition and attempted to restore the Shu kingdom. His friendship with Zhang Hui grew in the coming months. They rode in the same chariot, sat at the same table for meals, and it's noted how complimentary Zhang Hui was to others about Jiang Wei. Jiang Wei attempted to create a wedge between Sima Zhao and Zhang Hui by drawing parallels to previous rulers who grew jealous of their most famous officers, which usually ended in tragedy. Jiang Wei tried to coax him into retirement. Zhang Hui replied how he cannot do this, also how there is no need for him to do this. Jiang Wei then said, I only suggested that you go into retirement. I am sure that given your intelligence, you can think of other options and carry them out. You don't need an old man like me to get long-winded on this. This conversation further deepened the relationship between the two. Zhang Hui framed Deng Ai for a rebellion and had him arrested then sent back to the capital, giving him complete control over the former Shu territories. Next, he declared himself the governor of Yi province and revolted against the Wei regent Sima Zhao. 
As they gathered their armour and prepared to march on their way capital, they heard commotion from outside. Many Wei officers refused to participate and soldiers were gathering at the city gates. When Zhang Hui asked Jiang Wei on how they should handle the officers leading the men, he simply responded with, kill them. This escalated the situation, and soon people were climbing up the walls with ladders and setting fire to the buildings. Zhang Hui and Jiang Wei killed about five or six of the mutineering soldiers before they were overrun and killed. The Wei troops then went on to kill Jiang Wei's wife and children. The chronicles of Hua Yang claim Jiang Wei was only pretending to cooperate with Zhang Hui, whilst his true intentions were to lead the Shu forces to kill all the Wei officers and restore their state. He sent a letter to Liu Shan which reads, I hope that your majesty can temporarily endure humiliation over the next few days. I am planning to overturn the situation and restore our state in the same way the sun and moon transition from darkness to brightness. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and I'll see you next time. Jiang Wei's body was cut open where it is stated that his gallbladder was large enough to hold a litre. Now I'm not a doctor, but I assume that means he was ill.